Hey, what's up you amazing hackers? I hope you're all doing well today. Welcome to Uncle Rat's Ultimate Guide to Server-Side Request Forgery. Now, server-side request forgery can occur in different forms. It occurs when the server makes an HTTP request to an URL which we can control. If we can make the server execute that HTTP request to an arbitrary web server, we might have a ser server-sided request forgery on our hands. Usually we will abuse this vulnerability as bug bounty hunters by making the server execute a request to itself on a port which only accepts requests from the internal network or to other servers who also only accept the requests from the internal network. Another way to abuse this vulnerability would be to make a request to a third party or external service that only accept requests coming from our target. <clears throat> now let's give you guys an example to make things more clear. Imagine you have a database server and an API server and a web server. So uh, this is grossly oversimplified, I know, but I'm just trying to bring my point across. Say we as a user make a GET request to um, the web server to get the home page, the web server will make some requests to the database and to the API or to the API and the API will make some database requests, however it works. So the request will return a 200 OK and it will return whatever information is on the web page. Now let's say we make a request to the API directly instead of to the web server. So instead of getting slash API, uh, instead of getting slash index.php, we make a GET request to slash API slash V1 slash invoices slash one. This might return a 403 forbidden because the page is only accessible from the internal network and we might get that error message as well. So to illustrate how an SSRF works, we will first discuss an imaginary software system for saving profile pictures with this in mind. So say you want to upload your profile picture to Amazon Web Services, that would be number one, you make a post request to Amazon aws.com slash upload.php and the body contains the data, so you get a 200 OK back and you get the URL on which the file has been uploaded to. Now as a second request, you make a post to your profile picture.php page and you insert the URL and you get a 200 OK back because the server accepts that the URL is Amazon. Now, let's say you make a third request. So you make a get profile picture.php request. To do that, what the server is going to do is going to make a get request to slash profile picture URL. And then it's going to make a get request to the actual profile picture because first of all it needs to know where that profile picture is stored on Amazon and then it's going to return where that profile picture that the full profile picture it's going to make a request for that profile picture and it's going to return that so that's just an HTTP request that's happening now we can abuse this in several ways if the developer was not careful when implementing this feature if we intercept the request at number two, which saves the URL for the profile picture, and instead of the Amazon AWS URL, we enter a URL to the database server, we should not get a response because the developer should make sure in this feature that it only resolves requests to AWS. But if the developer forgot to implement that security feature, we have an SSRF on our hands. Now, how do, I ex how do we exploit this? So we basically want to test any URL that gets resolved by the server and that we can control for SSRF vulnerabilities. First, for the, for the basic attacks, and if this doesn't work, we can always test for blind SSRF vulnerabilities. But of course, guys, those are going to be much harder to exploit and they often require re uh, remote code executions. Some other harder to locate SSRF attack surfaces can be found at partial URLs in the body instead of the full URL. So instead of the full URL, you will get like only a part of the URL that might be also an attack surface for you. Um, URLs within data files, such as XML files or CSV files, say for example, import functionality or referrer headers can sometimes contain SSRF defects as well. 
Now SSRF against the server itself is one of the possibilities that we have here. And basic SSRF attacks against the server itself can arise when we want to attack a service that runs on a loopback IP address, but it only accepts requests from within that server. So for example, if we have a web server running on port 80 and an admin panel running on port 81, we might only be able to access the admin panel from the server itself. So an example I can give you guys is on screen right now, a post to profile pic url.php where the URL is 127.001 as an IP address, double point 81 for the port, slash get users.php, and that might return a 200 OK with all of the names and email addresses of all of the users. Now, if you guys want some additional practice on that, you can find some SSRF against local host vulnerabilities on the port Swigger Labs. But we also have SSRF attacks against other backend systems. That's also a possibility. And these basic SSRF attacks can occur when we have a service running on a port that only resolves requests from the internal network, such as an admin panel on port 3387, but on a different IP address in that same network. So an example can again be found on screen. You have a post to the profile picture url.php but instead the URL this time is 192.168.32.123. So that's the IP address of a different server on the network and it goes to port 3387 and it gets again get users.php, which again will return the names and the email addresses of all the users. Now these are just theoretical examples, of course, you're going to have to think outside of the box and dig deep, but these basic, uh, basic examples should help give you an understanding of how you can look for SSRF vulnerabilities and how you can exploit them eventually, because that's also very important. If you can't demonstrate the impact of your vulnerability, it's not even worth looking for that vulnerability, in my opinion. As for blind SSRF, we need to have our Burp Collaborator open for this and use the URL provided or use the public Burp Collaborator URL but Portswigger offers no availability warranty for this guy, so beware when you do use it. Simply replace the attack factors that you would for a normal SSRF attack with the Burp Collaborator URLs, and when you see an HTTP request come in, you might have an SSRF vulnerability, but it will be hard to exploit, since you might need to find a remote code execution to exploit it. Now, ex exploiting blind SSRFs is also out of the scope of this video, uh, since Uncle Red himself usually shies away from this. Um, also, one thing I wanted to tell you guys, if you only receive DNS requests and no HTTP requests, that means that the HTTP requests are filtered when outgoing, so that makes it nearly impossible to exploit an SSRF, and you should probably drop it by then. So that was my guide to SSRF vulnerabilities. I hope you guys enjoyed. If you did, I would really appreciate it if you guys could leave me a like. And if you start hunting for SSRFs and you find anything, let me know, please, because I love hearing that kind of stuff. Thank you guys very much for watching my video. I hope you had a really good time and I hope you have a nice day. Bye, everybody. See you later.